morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the second session of uh, today's yeah, seminar. Uh, my name is Mary C. Murphy, and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Government and Politics, a colleague of Fiona's. Uh, so I was delighted to be asked to chair this session. I think it's, it's very rare I've ever chaired a session or a panel or been involved in a panel which has been all women. So, <laughs> so this is very nice. Um, uh, congratulations to Fiona for today's event. It's, um, it's, it's a fantastic event with a, a, a really wonderful um, array of speakers and range of perspectives. Um, and I, I really am delighted to be part of it. Uh, we have five speakers for this particular panel, and this is a panel which is um, based around the Feminist Institutionalism International Network. So it's looking at gender um, and why it's important to study gender um, and power and political institutions, um, but maybe more especially about how to go about that process of study. Uh, so we have five very eminent speakers here, and we're, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to each of them. They'll speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open up to the floor for Q&A. Um, but our first speaker, Fiona, is doing a stellar job today. <laughs> the other Fiona either doesn't like you <laughs> or thinks you're just wonderful. And I suspect it's the latter. Um, but uh, you've already been introduced uh, to Fiona since this morning, but um, we've met Fiona before. Uh, she was here to deliver the Philip Monaghan lecture recently. Um, and Fiona has a, a, a fantastic CV, which was recently added to by that wonderful award, which I think you're picking up tomorrow? Uh, Thursday. Thursday in Amsterdam. Um, so Fiona is a real star of the gender politics, the study of gender politics. So uh, I'm delighted to welcome Fiona. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everybody, it's me again. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Fiona. Um, what we decided was that in that, that I would sort of just give a, a very brief context to feminist institutionalism, and then others will will take it forward in different ways. So I want to give you a bit of context about the history and origins of feminist institutionalism. Why did we embark on? what is a collaborative theory building project, what were the problems it's aiming to solve, and what's the distance uh, we've travelled. Uh, if I have time, I then want to set up three sets of challenges uh, for FI going uh, forward. <coughs> so first off, the history and origins of FI. So I think that what I want to stress here is that really from its earliest days, an important part of feminist political science has been concerned by institutions of state and society, and crucially, the interconnection, particularly explaining the underrepresentation uh, of women in public institutions and in political life, um, the marginalization and misrecognition of, of so called uh, women's issues in, in the policy and, and political sphere, and the outcomes and consequences for, for, for women as a, as a category and different groups uh, of women in terms of resources, policy, legitimacy, and power. Um, and this has had a number of dimensions, documenting and explaining, if you like, the processes and the outcomes of the entry of women, including feminists, into legislative, executive, bureaucratic and judicial, judici judicial sorry, I've got my teeth in, institutional arenas, and specific strategies uh, of feminist institution building, which we can trace back to the, the kind of pioneering work that happened in Australia around the, the, the Australian femocrats who moved into uh, institutions of, of, of governance and then were also then studied um, uh, by uh, feminist political scientists. Um, what we've seen are, I think, a whole set of, of international norm changes, particularly around uh, quotas, around policy agendas, particularly around gender-based violence, gender mainstreaming. They are, in and of themselves, remarkable cases of norm and policy diffusion and they are almost entirely ignored by uh, wider policy studies, wider uh, political uh, science. And then there's been another set of areas, which is really the impact of broader institutional change on women, on gender relations, on gender equality and justice. And that's, if you like, paying attention to um, restructuring trends in many advanced democratic welfare states, um, involving processes of marketization, regionalization, decentralization, wealth estate retrenchment, constitutional reform, and then efforts at institutional redesign experienced in both globally peaceful and violent transitions to democracy, um, 
and new processes of state and institution building. Uh, I'm thinking of Georgina's work on Latin America, but we've seen work around Eastern Europe, Africa, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, and so on. So really, from the 1990s onwards, there was a real concern with opening up what had been um, the black box, if you like, of state, of state institutions, against also, I think, a backdrop of um, theoretical and empirical interests in variations and how to explain variations within and across countries. And if you like, this um, empirical and theoretical work was triggered by real world feminist engagements in and against the state, um, which led in turn, I think, to this um, theoretical reconsideration of uh, political and state institutions and the work uh, they've done. So the idea, if you like, was that we needed to move beyond like documenting sex imbalance and sexism uh, to um, starting to look at institutional level uh, uh, analysis, analyzing the underlying structures which underpin these institutionalized patterns of advantage and disadvantage according to gender. So I think what's important here is under, the understanding of institutions um, as important modes of constraint but also as resources that actors, and, and a lot of the emphasis in, in the work has been around feminist actors, can use to affect or resist change. So feminist political science have kind of circled uh, what's called the new institutionalist analysis, I don't know whether it can be called new anymore, um, uh, but really since the 1990s. So work by Lawton Dusky, Gatons, work by uh, Louise Chappell and uh, uh, Laura Weldon into the 2000s. Uh, Georgina Ware in 2007, and so on. So the key mantra in institutionalism is that institutions matter in the organization of political life. They are the rules of the game, and whether by design or by evolution, they shape behavior, interests, and outcomes. To which feminist institutionalism adds the simple, well, not simple, um, uh, key part of the mantra that those institutions are gendered and have gendered effects. So what do we mean by gendered institutions? So by using the term gendered, I think that what FI scholars have done is they've drawn upon the wider uh, feminist social science, which understands gender, uh, the classic kind of Scott definition, as a primary way of signifying relationships of power, and that they intersect with other power relations, such as those based on race and class. So to say that an institution is gendered, using um, uh, ACCA in this respect, means that the constructions of masculinity and femininity are deeply enmeshed in the daily culture or logic of political institutions. So what I can argue, which I think is, is also central to how FI have taken this forward, is that rather than existing out there in society or fixed within individuals which they then bring into the institution, Gender relations, practices, and ideologies are produced and reproduced within institutional arenas, such as parliaments, uh, political parties, etc. And they're used in ways which justify, explain, and legitimize institutions and their gender patterns of hierarchy and exclusion. And I think that what this means is that the informal uh, is as important as the formal in getting at the work that gender does and the effects of gendered institutions. So Vivian Lowndes, who's not here today, but is a key part of uh, TIN, she helpfully breaks this down into rules about gender. I think we could say rules about sex and gender. Uh, so for example, you could think of marriage bars on the one hand, or sex discrimination legislation as a more progressive version of that. Rules that have gendered effects, so rules that on the face of it uh, look neutral, but impact differentially uh, on uh, women and men, and we could pick up on some of the examples already today. So we could think about the informal rules that govern academic careers, which are typically uh, built around um, uh, male career paths of progression in terms of promotion, prestige, and salary by particularly mobility. So being able to move from institution to institution, whereas female academics generally have less mobility and therefore fewer chances to progress. And finally, uh, the insight that we also have gendered actors using the rules. Um, so for example, you could think about female and male actors who uh, occupy the same uh, 
position, so they have the same positional power, but have access to very different uh, resources, maybe subject to different sorts of power dependencies, uh, and thus have different uh, influence and efficacy. So for example, we can think of the way that women politicians are routinely excluded uh, from powerful informal uh, networks as a result of the norms of uh, homosociality, and I think um, that might pick up on some of those points later on. So new institutionalism has, uh, despite a stunningly good article uh, in the uh, Theresa's journal, um, <laughs> being mostly blind to gender. But the argument of FI is that gender necessarily impacts on how we conceive of concepts like past dependence, what is or isn't a critical juncture, logics of appropriateness, standard operating procedures, unintended consequences, and the processes of locking in and embedding new institutions. So, what were the problems that, that feminist political scientists were um, reaching out to FI to, to solve? So I think that feminist political science and FI as a, a, a sort of sub-branch of that are interested in real-world problems that we mentioned earlier. So how does change happen? What are the causal mechanisms? What's the role of timing, of sequence? Why did changing the formal rules not result in substantive change? And when reforms do happen, why so often are they rolled back? Uh, Marion Saw, reflecting on her early work on Australian femocrats, recently said, we didn't have the theories and tools to work with to understand what was happening. And I think many of us were frustrated uh, at the limits of social movement theory, particularly political opportunity structures, which, um, and this is drawing on Georgina's point, which seemed to overburden actors. So women's movement actors became, if you like, in, in the kind of theories of change, there's overemphasis on their agency uh, and far too much reliance on grassroots women's movements as motors of change. Um, overly voluntaristic accounts, on the other hand, of, of female and feminist actors inside institutional arenas. Um, and if you like, uh, a need to be able to move beyond the over-determination, uh, and I mean all institutions in a way are over-determined, which is why they're institutions, but to try and find a, a midway through to capture messiness and complexity, but also to have some explanatory power, that we couldn't keep going with these incredibly detailed fine grain analysis from which we found it hard to then draw some, you know, at least modest generalizations. Um, I think equal frustration as well at some feminist approaches which dismissed, uh, you know, we've seen an institutionalization in the real world, feminists moving into institutions, women moving into institutions, and a frustration at, at approaches which dismissed those efforts of outsiders within um, as futile, um, a, a kind of an underplaying of agency, uh, a, a kind of approaches which saw co-option as inevitable. Um, so the question that Johnny Lomondusky, who's arguably the godmother of FI, was how do we move beyond documenting and describing patterns of discrimination and exclusion to analyzing how institutions shape and reproduce gender power relations, and more importantly, or as importantly, how those institutions can be challenged and uh, reformed. The argument was and remains that gendered institutions are crucial for understanding power inequalities in public and political life. So, how have we done so far? Well, we've grown from a workshop in Edinburgh of about a dozen people to a global network of around a hundred, maybe more. And we started off by asking, is there or can there be feminist institutionalism? If so, what does it comprise? How might it be operationalized? And what's the added value of this approach for both mainstream and feminist political analysis? We've explored, I think, the synergies between institutionalist theory and uh, gender uh, analysis. We've integrated gender analysis with institutionalism. Um, we've, I think, demonstrated why the informal is uh, as important as the formal. Uh, we've looked at actors and discourses. And there's still a lot to do, but we've begun to either adapt or develop toolkits and methods to try and uncover the ways in which gendered institutions do their work. Um, again, taking from channeling Vivian Lowndes, Feminist institution needs to find um, strategies and tools for surfacing, uh, if you like, and then finding ways to resist and dismantle discriminatory and exclusionary effects of 
gendered institutions in different contexts. And that might be in order to uh, better understand why gender equalities uh, reforms fail uh, or succeed or are limited in their effects, how gender equality commitments can be embedded beyond those kind of moments of opportunity, um, moments of activism, and the influence of individual uh, actors in terms of uh, breaking rules, playing the rules, uh, maintaining the rules. And I would add uh, another dimension to that, which is also what is the gendered impact of some of these wider pro processes of change, uh, which we see both progressive uh, and regressive. I think that what we've demonstrated is that the rules and norms and practices about gender are particularly sticky. Um, that there are very complex uh, institutional legacies which work to limit change. And I think in part because gender is such a fundamental part of the status quo and the way of the legitimacy, if you like, of the status quo. Uh, we've also, I think, demonstrated that that daily, that this is not fixed, but there's a daily practicing uh, of gender, which can be seen, I think, as, as a really important mechanism through which more general processes of institutional reform and innovation can be resisted or indeed progressed. I mean, it's an empirical question in which direction, although there's a good deal of pessimism uh, about the direction uh, within uh, the empirical work. So we've raised questions as to whether variations in gender practice and in gender regimes in different institutional settings may provide some exploratory uh, power for wider patterns of institutional variance and difference. Whether, if you like, changes in gender relations or the wider gender order, which is, if you like, the overall societal gender foundations and formations, may provide an important source of externally generated change. Or, on the other hand, whether local variations in institutional gender regimes and tensions uh, may in turn trigger uh, internally generated change. So there's considerable potential for productive dialogue between new institutionalism and uh, FI, uh, but I think let would not be surprised that with a few honourable exceptions, mainstream institutionalists largely continue uh, to ignore us. I think I might be out of time, so I will leave my challenges for another time. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Shona. I think that sets up the panel for uh, for looking in more depth at some of the themes that you've touched on. But I think it also points to the sort of the powerfulness of the network that you've created as well, which is a real testament to all your work. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Georgina Whalen, who joins us from the University of Manchester today. Um, Georgina has published on many aspects of gender and politics and political economy and global governance, and she's also uh, has been involved in the ERC, ERC advanced grant looking specifically at um, institutional change from a gender perspective and Georgina is the co-director of, uh, of this particular network. So, over to you. I don't know what, what the powerpoint is, it doesn't sure. particularly matter. Wait a minute. Okay, well thanks to Fiona for putting this together and for inviting me and to all the other contributors. Now, to follow uh, Fiona's kind of other Fiona's uh, overview, I'm going to focus primarily on the role of the informal and particularly why it's <coughs> important to look at the informal and what it can tell us about gender and power and political institutions and also a little bit about how to go about this kind of research. And as part of this, um, I'm going to highlight, as Fiona has done with it, both the role of institutions and their rules and their norms and their practices, but also the key roles that uh, critical actors can play within those institutions using and sort of manipulating uh, the rules and norms. And I think this is particularly important, but I think it's important in all contexts, for understanding how extremely male-dominated institutions work in gendered ways and uh, how an understanding of the informal can kind of inform how 
we can get change within those institutions. And I think um, if we were going to talk about feminist institutionalism as a sort of spectrum, I think probably I'm somewhere at the kind of agentic end of the spectrum for feminist institutionalists. Because I think perhaps I give more um, space for critical actors to act within institutional constraints, and particularly within critical junctures. Um, I think actors really matter. So I think I may be, but this is maybe something we can talk about, seeing actors as maybe less constrained by institutions than perhaps, I know we've had this argument before, than Louise and, and Fiona do. And I think as an example of this, certainly at a critical juncture, just look at the mess that is Brexit in the UK and what difference actors have made, particular actors have made in creating and perpetuating that mess. knows where, how or when it's going to end. And I'm just going to use the example of some of my research about global economic governance, where there has been change, but I think um, it's still perhaps, perhaps some of the most <coughs> male-dominated set of institutions are at the international and the, the global um, level. And I think to understand how global economic governance is gendered and the possibilities and the limits uh, for change, we have to uncover uh, the hidden life of global economic governance institutions, and, as Louise and I argued um, several years ago. And I don't, you can't achieve change in those institutions without understanding the role of the informal, um, at the very least, and also how the informal might be able to be used as part of strategies to get change. And I think the same arguments go for universities often, um, to echo the kind of our other theme, they're still very male dominated at the higher levels, including, you know, vice chancellors. Even in my institution where we have a female at the head, she's actually surrounded then at the next level by a, a, a coterie of predominantly men. So she travels around the world, you know, representing the university world. The men actually run the university in the day to day. Um, sense. So I think we have. That's why we have to look at both the formal within formal institutions, the informal within formal institutions, but also at informal institutions and organisations of global economic government themselves. <coughs> so that's why it's important to look at this hidden life, not just the top layer um, of what you see. Uh, only the other day. Um, but to go underneath and look behind the scenes of both formal and informal institutions. Now that brings up the question of how we actually do that kind of research. It's generally acknowledged to be difficult, and there are several different ways I think we can do this. Um, perhaps the most um, common or widely used is index qualitative research, even um, ethnographic methods. And I don't know, are you going to talk about rapid Right, okay. So Louise and Natalie are going to talk a bit about rapid ethnography. But I think that's not only um, not the only ways of doing that. I think we can supplement, in many cases, that uh, index qualitative work with quantitative analysis too, in certain contexts. I've done a bit of work uh, about the UK parliamentary expenses scandal, seeing the um, regime, the expenses regime in place before the scandal erupted in 2009 as an informal set of norms and um, practices, a sort of informal <coughs> institution. There were very few formal rules and it was mainly all organised and formally. And I would argue you can only really fully assess how those institutions were gendered by supplementing interviews and documents, um, by actually analysing male and female MPs' behaviour quantitatively. If we want to know, um, fitting into debates about corruption, are men and women as likely or less likely to be corrupt? You can only really find out how far the female MPs were actually more or less guilty of any behaviour deemed to be uh, wrongdoing the male MPs 
by looking quantitatively at their expenses claims. And in the same way, if you want to find out whether male, female MPs change their behaviour more than male MPs under the new formal institutional regime put into place after the expenses scandal by doing that quantitatively. And the answers you find is that pre the scandal breaking, the male and female MPs were equally, equally um, engaged in behaviour that was seen as wrongdoing. But the female MPs were treated differently by the media and the electorate. And afterwards, the female MPs changed their behaviour more than the male MPs under the new formal regime. Something which you wouldn't have been able to work out without that quantitative element. And I think also there's, in thinking about ethnographic methods, there's a, an issue, which I'd be interested to hear what, what you say about this, of how you research things that have already happened. As someone who's very influenced by historical institutionalism, if you want to research events in the past, but you can't observe now through ethnographic methods. How do you do that in an in-depth, qualitative way? How do you supplement um, interviews and things like that? And another avenue I, I think I'm going to look at is also something that's used a lot in diplomatic studies, practice theory, um, which comes out of diplomatic studies, which obviously you have to look at micro practices and communities as practice, whether that might also help us in thinking about um, analysing informal institutions. But I'm just um, going to say a little bit now, how much long have I got left? Okay, <laughs> about some research I've been doing about uh, global economic governance and the role of the informal in that. And the starting point is that the global financial crisis brought some important changes to global economic governance. And it became much more diffuse, much broader, much bigger uh, range of institutions involved, coalitions of different actors like NGOs and corporations uh, in public-private partnerships. And it also brought, um, as part of this more diffuseness of global economic governance, a bigger role for informal networks and organisations. And the G7 and the G20 in particular are the biggest examples of this. And I think the reinvention of the G20 post-2008 has been one of the biggest changes in global economic governance. And as you can see from this picture just from this weekend, it's become a leaders forum of the key countries, middle income countries, um, not just developed countries, but it's also organised relatively informally. It's got no machinery of its own, it's got no secretariat, it's organised by a troika of the host country, in this case Japan, of the previous country to host the G20 and then the subsequent one. It started off just by managing the global financial crisis, but it's broadened out uh, to cover all a much broader agenda since then. And it's been very little studied by gender scholars, except for a few, uh, Susan and Harris Grimmer being one of the most uh, notable, focusing on either the, the di diplomatic aspect or the legal aspect. But there's been very little by either IR scholars or IP scholars. So I'm interested and done a little case study in how this um, very informal network or club, as some people call it, and very male-dominated group, as you can see from uh, this picture, came to adopt a limited gender equality measure of increasing, of a goal to increase women's employment by 25% uh, by 2025. This was adopted at the G20 meeting in Brisbane in 2014. So how did this happen? I mean, firstly, we can look at the increased, and this is 2012, but the same was true in 2014, there were actually more women leaders uh, involved in the G20 um, at this point. And it was actually the high point of women's leadership between 2012 and, and 2014. But we have to go under the surface and not just look at um, the women, the, the leaders. We also have to examine the behind the scenes roles, and particularly in terms of actors, the so-called um, Sherpas, 
who do most of the negotiating at the G20, not just the meetings, uh, the summits like this one, but for the whole year. And they come from the member countries. This is a picture of uh, the G20 Seoul Sherpas in 2010. They come not just from the member countries, but also the so-called knowledge organizations like the OECD that do a lot of work for the G20, given that it has its no officials or secretariat of its own and this relatively informal structure. And as you can see from that picture there, traditionally the Sherpas have been very male dominated. But in fact, if you look at 2014, the Sherpas, this is another so-called family picture, all looking very happy on a trip out. It was actually a high point for women's participation, not just as leaders, but also uh, for women Sherpas. There were far more female Sherpas than usual. And in particular, the Australian uh, Sherpa was a woman, which given that the host country has a lot of influence on the agenda, of the G20 is actually in the absence of these formal structures was actually very significant and also the Sherpa for the OECD which is the key one of the key knowledge organizations for the OECD uh, is also a woman but there were women Sherpas for the US for the ILO and various other countries and you can see how they use the particular sort of informal institutional context of the G20 in very sort of deliberate ways. Firstly, by framing policy proposals in a particular narrow way, if you like, um, that fitted into the sort of dominant gender equality as smart economics discourse, and also fitted in with the Australian agenda for that year, which was about growth and growth and employment, so increasing women's participation in employment fitted that. Um, arguing that it would help to solve some of the post-global financial crisis economic problems, boosting uh, women's productivity. They very deliberately produced a lot of documentation just a minute, okay, yeah, to back up their arguments, and the OECD, led by their chef, took the lead on this, introduced documents to crucial meetings, they used, and a lot of this is familiar with what we've talked about in the previous session, male allies to introduce measures, particularly the Japanese male Sherpa introduced um, some of these uh, key measures and argued, argued on the side for in favour of the proposals, and then used a lot of informal networks to um, try and neutralise opposition to the proposal, particularly from Mexico, but also tried to do it from, there was a lot of opposition from Russia and China, and helped by some outside activists organizing things. And I think it shows how critical actors in the right positions can use the informality of an organization like the G20 to achieve some very narrowly framed gender equality measures. And I think it shows how we need to look at both formal and the informal to get a full picture of, of gender actors and how their tactics and strategies need to use informal as well as formal mechanisms to get change. Thanks very much, Georgina. We didn't manage to get through a session without mentioning Brexit. I think. <laughs> no, not because of the UK. There's no way you can do that. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Louise Chappelle to speak next. Um, Louise joins us from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. She's the director of the Aust Australian Human Rights Institute there, and um, is 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 another um, gender politics specialist and a global gender politics specialist with two award-winning monographs um, under her belt. She's also uh, a co-director of this particular network. Thanks, Louise. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll sit over here. Um, um, slide 
Well, again, thank you, everyone, for um, coming along today, and a special thank you to Fiona um, for organising this. And I've been here as a visitor in court for two weeks and have had the most wonderful time. I'm very sad to be leaving this afternoon. <laughs> um, but thrilled that we're able to come together today to um, have this, this discussion. Um, so Natalie and I are working as a bit of a, a tag team um, today, and we're really going to dig into the how of doing uh, feminist institutionalism and giving you uh, a snapshot of a rapid ethnography uh, that Natalie and I were involved in. So this was a product that was uh, a project that was funded by the Australian Research Council um, in a, what's called a linkage grant, which is where you engage directly with industry partners. Um, and it was part of um, Natalie's PhD where uh, she'd come back from working in construction in the Middle East to, to reflect on her time there. And um, it's a place I never thought I'd go in my career onto a construction <laughs> site, ever, ever, ever. But it was so revealing and so interesting and so many similarities between the political world that I've been studying for all the years before that. Um, uh, and then now I've got a great fascination for this this uh, industry as well. So our research question is, the, you know, the Australian construction industry, and it's uh, very similar across the world, um, is the most male-dominated of all um, sectors in Australia. And efforts to uh, increase the retention, uh, the recruitment, retention and progression of women um, has been taken very seriously. and. Uh, mm -hmm. There are now um, pieces of legislation in place to try and ensure some of this occurs, but also industry itself has taken this quite seriously. And you can see that through their policy documents and so on, um, which in some cases have gold standard policies around um, uh, particularly recruitment, family leave, those sorts of things. So um, our question is, given that those policies are in place, um, why is it that women's numbers have reduced over time rather than increased over time? Um, and why have those those formal rules that um, we were able to identify and, and document have failed to produce the change that um, everyone expected that they would? So here we are um, uh, as, as uh, sort of uh, ethnographers on site. Um, Natalie did many more sites than me, but I'll just tell you a quick story about my pink hat. So we were there to be the flies on the wall, to not be seen. I arrive on site and the um, project manager hands me a white hat like that, mm -hmm. that's wearing there. And then he just went, oh, hold on a minute. He had to run for about five minutes down the stairs, around the corner, into the storeroom to shuffle around to find the pink hat, the colour of, of your top there. <laughs> that, um, it's actually got a cricketing um, standard on there. It's a breast cancer um, hat. Um, so, And I was the only one on site that day to be wearing this <laughs> hat. So, so much for staying undercover. But, um, but in other sites, I mean, Natalie did fit in. And that, and that was the point. We were there to observe. Um, people and to follow them in there. We wanted to look at a day in the life. So we'd say, we'll meet you at the hour that you start work. We will stay th with you through to the end of the day and we'll follow um, what you do and just sort of act as if we're not here. For the first hour, they were always really like, oh, are you okay? Or what are you doing? And then they got so busy that they didn't, they didn't have any sense of what we were doing or where we were. They'd just ignore us, basically, which was perfect. That's what we wanted to happen. Um, so we were really looking at if the formal isn't working, what, what work is informal, the informal doing here? Um, but first we had to look at what the formal rules actually were, so we did a very deep dive into the, the policies of these um, particular two organisations, top tier one uh, construction um, agencies, and then we wanted to get to the informal rules. Uh, by going in to do an observation of these people in their workplace. And the observation happened uh, at the most senior level, the project managers, down to um, the sort of people who were um, doing the day-to-day -day work. I, I should say that we're looking at professionals here, not the trades workers. So 
the engineers, the um, project managers, the lawyers, the architects, and so on. Um, so we did here employ uh, Vivian Lowndes' framework um, that uh, Fiona's already mentioned, the rules about gender, the rules with gendered effects, gendered actors working with the rules, to see how this all produced particular gendered outcomes. And we found this framework incredibly useful in doing our analysis, and it's something that I've now carried over with me to looking at um, women in Vietnamese politics, which is my current project, which is a completely, you know, again, a different context altogether, but it's a framework that's working really beautifully uh, in terms of looking at that interaction between the formal and the informal. Um, and uh, Francesca Gaines and Vivian Lowndes have uh, written this up in a piece in um, politics, especially on politics and gender. So in terms of the formal rules, I've already said we, we saw all the usual sorts of things, affirmative action uh, in place uh, towards graduate recruitment, gender bias training really entrenched. Um, I could go on about that for a long time, but I won't. Uh, we, a lot of women support groups and trying to create women-only spaces and so that they can support each other. Um, mentoring, though, we realised became a problem because there was a few, very few senior women at the top and quite a number of women at the entry level, but the mid-level had been completely stripped out to the extent that we couldn't find anyone to follow, really. So we, we went and sought out some to do interviews, but they were few and far between. They'd gone by the time they got to that mid-level. Um, we, we saw flexible work arrangements, parental leave and so on. So we couldn't really fault them in terms of having you know, pretty good gender diversity policies in place. But what we were seeing was that the rules with gendered effects were much more important here. They were sort of counteracting and cutting across the gendered rules, the positive gendered rules that have been put in place. So one thing that, you know, Natalie really understood this because of her experience in the construction sector, that the contract that drove the work was the, the absolute um, king or queen, really the king, of the, of the whole process, um, that everything had to run to time because there were huge sort of liabilities and damages if that didn't happen. And because of that, they wouldn't just run to time, they'd run to pre-time. So the pressure on everyone to get the work done, like literally months in advance. So the time pressures became just extraordinary and was a thing that was counteracting anything else. And I sat behind a project manager one day just while he was doing his emails and he was just going, delete, 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 delete. And I said, do you know You know, what were they about? And he said, they're from head office. I've got no time for that. So who's making all the policies? Head office. They were just gone. They were wiped out. Um, we also see a real emphasis on safety. And there has been a shift in safety standards. So we're also thinking, you can shift safety, you can shift gender. But um, that was... Uh, it, was, it was interesting to see that it was very much focused on the physical, not on the emotional and the psychological. And that was coming up for us all the time that um, men were experiencing extreme stress at work, high rates of anxiety. The construction has got the highest rate of suicide and attempted suicide, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, blah, blah, blah. And we could then tell them why that's the case because of this stress. But then in terms of informal rules, we were seeing this thing about presenteeism. So being on the job in Australia at six days a week, they're trialling a new process of a five-day work week. It's counted as an innovation. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Nat, Nat, Nat's about to start a project following an innovative five-day work week. Um, <laughs> so, University should try it. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, it's exactly yeah. right. But... Uh, I was with a young woman one day on site who was telling me she had finished her really main part of the job. She was a young engineer. She was responsible for bringing all the steel on site. That had all been managed, but she still had to turn up to work on the Saturdays um, and sit and do nothing because everyone else was doing that. And if she didn't turn up, she was, um, and she did once not turn up, 
she was harassed, she was pilloried, there were jokes made about her about the, being the lazy person on site. So there's nothing about efficiency here, it's just turning up for the job. And that connects to this total availability, so you're always on at home and at work. And even if your day is from 6 to a.m. to 9 p.m., you're supposed to take your work home with you um, and often experiencing um, people telling us they're working until 2 or 3 in the morning. And I know we've got some of that in our work lives, but I've never seen it to such an extent. Uh, there was a real um, sort of emphasis on technical prowess and skills. Home sociability, the drinking culture, um, the time, going, going to the rugby together, going to sport together. It's a very male, very male dominated sort of environment. But also there was an expectation on men that they had to go and perform this as well. Um, so this kept coming up to, to, through our observations, people talking about their divorces, their difficulty because they were still expected after work to be going off to join into these things because that's the networking and that's where it happens. And amazingly, I'm finding exactly that in Vietnam. Alcohol and networking is absolutely key and women are seen not to be able to go because their health isn't good enough to withstand the amount of alcohol they have to drink. Um, we also saw huge differences in pay and the way pay was understood. So um, we, it was really interesting, uh, and Nat will talk more about this, the way we paired ourselves up to do this research, but I was very much the outsider, Nat very much the insider. So we'd see different things. Um, I was really noticing the hyper-feminine um, dress codes of the women in head office, all in dresses, no trousers, all in high heels, lots of bling. Um, and the men, the men could turn up in anything. They could turn up in worksite clothes and no one would, uh, would, would bat an eyelid. Very heteronormative expectations about behaviour on site. Lots of swearing, the language tone. Mm -hmm. And then they turn around and apologise to us and then fucking go on about something else. You know, it was just like this constant, oh, sorry, love, sorry, love, sorry, yeah, love. Yeah. Um, but Nat will can talk more about that. Um, so we did see this in terms of gendered outcome, really significant differences between what was going on in head office and then all the good plans and what was happening on site. And when I think about universities and diversity policies, and I'd love to talk to you more about it, Yvonne, too, and, and the Athena Swan stuff, it looks so beautiful on paper. But who's, who's down in the schools and who's down in the subsections of schools actually watching who's inter interpreting this and how is it being interpreted? based on that sort of um, local environment. Uh, we saw so much masculinity on display, masculine privilege, ma masculine advantage, and Nat's written beautifully on this in her PhD. Um, but it has the flip side of massive masculine disadvantage. And they can see it, but they don't talk to each other about it. But we did become counsellors. You know, we, people were revealing stuff to us especially to Nat, because she was seen as being very authentic, having had come from the industry. Uh, and then there's very obvious expectations around femininity as well. Um, and complete and utter blindness to care responsibilities. Um, just And this is an industry, of course, where you, you're not located in one place. You move around. You move around your city, and it might be from one side to the other, your ch and your childcare arrangements being worked out over here, and then you've got to literally be driving two hours there and back um, over the course of the childcare years, let alone the school years and so on, uh, and no real attention to that. So this was rapid ethnography in the fact that we were on site. We did um, how many sites? Six, six sites across uh, different cities and regional and urban sites. Um, we also added uh, many interviews along the way. Now we'll go through yeah. that. Um, and we did an analysis of the, of the policy documents. So it was sort of, we were trying to sort of triangulate it as we went. But I think you're right. I think it's hard to do. You can't do this work historically, really. But we were getting historical stories coming mm. through all the time. But we, there was no way for us to sort of verify that unless it had left an imprint in the documentation. Um, 
anyway, that that's a snapshot, and I've got to say it was the most revealing um, research project I've ever done methodologically. Like just being on the ground and being accepted as sort of a fly on the wall, which surprisingly to me happened incredibly quickly, uh, just allowed us to see the informal in a way that um, you just you couldn't have got out. We didn't get it out of the interviews. We just didn't. Mm -hmm. People just. After a day, they will trust you and they will tell you pretty much anything. Yeah. I remember that one guy that I was talking to, the senior project manager, at the end of the day, said, have you got any more questions for me? And I was deliberately not asking questions. And I said, no. And I said, have you got anything more you want to tell me? Two hours later, <laughs> where he just told me about his whole life and his challenges at work and his family breakdowns and... It's incredible. So um, full of richness and, and uh, real real interest. So I'm going to hand it over to Nat now to talk offline about the FERB project. So I'll just start by saying the lads on my, on the, I just realised that, that these guys um, here that are pixelated, they're actually an Irish crew of form workers. <laughs> um, and it was a bit of a joke because most of the Aussies couldn't understand that, what they were saying. <laughs> um, so my, um, oh wow, I'm going to click on you too. So today I'm going to talk about, um, you know, our just sort of um, go into a bit more depth about what we, how we shaped our project in terms of um, methodolo methodology and, you know, really seeing how we approach getting under the skin of these institutions, of these gendered institutions. And I guess one of the things that came out for me doing this research is that as a female researcher, because we're often drawn to this type of work, how do you do research in a very male-saturated environment, especially ethnography, where you really do want to be a fly on the wall? Um, so as Louise said, you know, construction is the most male-dominated sector in the country. Um, <coughs> men um, account for 97% of CEOs, about 88 to 86% of senior leaders and professionals. Um, and trades, it's the Mount Everest of problems. It's, um, men account for 99% of construction trades. The other thing is that women who enter the sector, as Louise said, leave the sector about 40% faster than their male equivalents. Um, and so, we were, as Louise said, so we were really interested in going to see how it was that, how these policies that started and were created in head office, and may I say often by women, mm. how they travelled onto construction sites and whether they stuck on sites or whether these sites were kingdoms of their own with their own set of rules in use. And I guess for us, the um, ethnography really um, allowed us to see what the rules in use were, that there were important formal policies like the contract, but there are also other informal um, rules and, and institutions like um, being totally available and being um, a presenteeism, which was very, and we could see the sanctioning occurring and that was the, mm -hmm. the beauty of the ethnography. Um, so in terms of, um, Feminist institutionalism, I'm just going to do a quick recap. Oh, yeah. Again, um, as March and Olsen note, institutions are stable, reoccurring operating systems, the do's and don'ts that actors learn on the ground. Um, and in construction companies we studied, as I said, you know, you had your formal construction contract, which was very important, but you also had legislation, um, particularly safety legislation was often angled against gendered um, policies, which was interesting. Um, and you had different policies, and often there were weak rules, mm -hmm. I would say some of them. There were some strong ones and then also some weak rules. And then we, we had informal practices and norms. Um, and what was really interesting is we got to see that gendered logic of appropriateness that Louise has termed. Um, we could see it in, in this, you know, for example, the sexist graffiti we saw marking all the walls. Um, on construction sites, which would blindly walk past where there was a trip hazard that would be identified and seen and corrected. I walk past this penetration sign which says, you know, there's a lift core behind it, so be careful if you're going to do any work, you may tumble down the core. And afterwards, I said to the construction manager after a week, I said, you know, whose book? Mm -hmm. He went, oh, I haven't seen it. 
So, you know, there was a gendered logic appropriateness that it was okay to sexualise women on a construction site and it was normalised to um, participate and behave in a certain type of mas hegemonic masculinity. Um, but as Louth observed, you know, informal rules, um, unlike on construction sites, often tend to shy away from publicity um, <laughs> because they're due to their widely accepted nature. And I guess my construction manager, it's so widely accepted to see a penis on a wall or boobs on hard hats that they stop seeing it. Um, and so it's, and sometimes for researchers, it's harder to detect. I mean, lucky for us, it's often we saw this pattern of informal rules occurring time and time again. Um, and so in terms of our research project, so we analysed 70 policies at the beginning of two large contractors. We did 21 formal interviews um, with senior leaders and that was really interesting because I actually felt that I, I conducted most of those and I suspect it was the first time they'd ever thought about gender mm -hmm. until they stepped into the room with me. They have since, I think a lot of them thought about it quite a lot since. Um, and we observed 14 company events just to sort of warm up our gatekeepers to build trust and rapport, particularly with human resources who didn't have the power mm -hmm. like the senior um, leaders on the construction sites. And then as Louise said, we observed six construction sites and on those sites we shadowed 44 um, construction management and professionals, so the people who are managing the sites, often white, uh, white collar university educated. And we interviewed 61 of them. Um, and the interesting thing is that I did it with a twin and in most cases it was a male researcher, um, Adam, and I obviously was the female, he the male, but I was the construction insider, having worked in the sector for about 17 years, um, and he the male outside of there's Adam. And um, we sort of yeah, interchanged with some of our other um, researchers, but what was often you know, the case was that Adam was expected to have been the inside, the construction mm -hmm. insider, because he was a man, um, which was interesting. Um, let me go through, okay. So I guess one of the things that I found interesting from being a researcher doing, you know, researching a male saturated environment was there was, um, Adam and I saw quite divergent informal rules and I, I won't say we, we saw them, we were always given access to different rules. And whilst we saw a number of rules and patterns of behaviour like presenteeism and sanctioning of presenteeism that were very obvious. There were other things that because of our, our, um, how we appeared as gendered actors, we got exposure to different things. And the other thing that I found interesting in my research is that my gender really stood in front of me being an insider. It was, I was far more treated like a woman than I was a construction professional. And it kind of um, ruled out the fact that I was an insider. I, I kind of sat in that, you know, um, midway point between no man's land or no woman's land, mm -hmm. between the two sort of um, being woman being um, a construction insider. And for um, Adam, who was the insider, he got vast, vastly more exposure to homosocial practices. Um, for instance, he was given a nickname, and I possibly was given one, but not to my face. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he was called Ads straight away. I, you know, I, they never shortened my name. But um, and he also got exposure to things like this greater exposure to the sexualisation of women. Um, you know, he got exposure to porn where I would see it on the wall, but someone would. And this is the other thing I found interesting that still old school, he still put the pornography on the wall <laughs> when Adam actually got the, the um, video shown to him off the phone, which I thought would be more changed. Um, and so the other thing is too, he got often told and spoke about more around the unfair advantage that women now have in construction. And I often have to say this to the when I speak to industry, there is an unfair advantage, but it is not in according to our data in the favour of women. Um, <laughs> So yeah, here's some of the, the, so the other thing I will say about our research is we went together onto site and at the end of every site visit, we actually um, 
we debriefed to each other and um, we highlighted what each of us saw on site. And um, that was where we had so much sharing of knowledge, but it was also how we were able to sort of correlate the practices that we saw on site and what really um, shone to us in terms of the informal and formal rules that we're interacting. So yeah, here at um, Adam being called ads. Um, oh yeah, and as Louise said, you know, I counted the number of times people apologised to me in the day, which made my father laugh because he said, "Christ, don't they know you? <laughs> swear like a, swear like a trucky." But anyway, um, but where Adam, you know, no one would have ever used a C bomb in front of me. Um, where Adam got this beautiful, rich homosocial dialogue that was happening in front of him, um, you know, here where the men were sort of asking each other to really put some cunt into it when they were negotiating with the subcontractors. That would never have, um, I would have had some exposure, but not to that degree. Um, and then obviously the sexualisation of, of women. Um, you know, Adam was, in this case, he was on, on a, in a car and they were, were on a military base and they were watching young women or, they were young, but women running, and you know the comment was made of you know, geez, you don't see that on site every day, and and it really also brought into the picture of Adam's feeling. He said, like, I didn't know how to respond. Do I play along with it as an ethnographer to perpetuate, you know, and and to stay under the radar, or do I, you know, um, arc up? You know, he said, look, like I laughed along. Um, and in terms of, um, yeah, and then the unfair advantage, as I said. For me, it, it was it was probably um, hinted at in the interviews, but for Adam, it came up time and time again. And, and here, I'm like, I never get a narrative to my face. And you're a woman. Um, and then, as the outsider, I mean, Louise that so beautifully. Um, you know, as a woman, I was more seen. I had to stand at a distance when I was doing the ethnography because I wasn't. Um, I, if I, especially if I was. Um, shadowing a, a younger woman. I really wanted to see what was happening. Um, and then also the counting the apologies every day. Um, there was a bit of sexual innuendo and we, you know, we mind you, shadowing me every day. Adam didn't get any of that. Um, <laughs> I was publicly belittled as well, where he never, he never was, um, quite um, aggressively as well. And then the thing that really stuck out for me, despite having been in the sector for such a long time, was that day in, day out, it was the, the walking with men on site and these walking interviews, which I think are really rich as well, of them revealing their vulnerability around mental health. Um, yeah, so this is apologising, um, belittling in terms of multiple occasions where this happened to me, you know, real power. Um, process of me being the outsider as well as a female but also um, the interviewer um, and you know like on my first day on site you know a site manager on the way to Smoko which is morning tea in Australia he said to me you know I'm having panic attacks and daily I think there was three men in my whole shadowing experience that did not report these um, issues around mental health and stress and that was certainly not um, and to Louise's point around masculinity, that is the really rich gender around the masculine, the rules around masculinity and the, and the, um, the way that they constrain men and their ability to express those rules. So yeah, for myself, I, I, I started off being an insider, but I feel like I was you know, less of an insider and um, this is a niche type of very Australian um, dessert. And I felt as I guess Buta said, you know, the he, they often describe themselves more as a half, they are neither fitting into either um, camp. So, um, and I think being that research, female researcher in a male dominant, dominated sector, there is, there's a real echoing of that other, otherness still there, even as a researcher. Um, I guess some of my so what takeaways that, you know, gender norms are contextual and temporal, and that's something, you know, is important that you might see it in different contexts, but they, they will have different um, flavours to them. Um, I also was really conscious of it's really important to, of how the researcher leaves their footprint in the field, their gender footprint, particularly in this case where Adam's real unease at how, well, how do I navigate the, the jokes around um, sexism as a researcher, 
do I perpetuate it, vice versa? Um, and as, as I said, you know, our experience as researchers often um, mirrored the gender power relations that we actually observed in the field. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. I didn't introduce Natalie, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of that presentation, but Natalie and Louise are obviously colleagues at the University of New South Wales. That was really fascinating. I admit I'm being a terrible chair um, because we've gone way over time, uh, but we're going to go on until 1.15 uh, so that we can um, hear from Katrina and then have some, some questions afterwards. So thank thanks you. very much. It really was fascinating. Um, Katrina? Katrina Nidera is um, a colleague from the School of Applied Social Studies here in UCC. And she's been doing a lot of work at an institutional level in terms of the Genovate program um, and has uh, an interest in gender politics from that particular institutional perspective. So over to you, okay. uh, Thank you very much. Um, I'll try not to, <laughs> not to um, hold you all here for too long um, with the, the graveyard slot. Uh, I suppose I'd just like to start by explaining that my background is um, in the social sciences. Uh, I'm not a political scientist. Uh, theoretically, I suppose I'd be influenced by feminist geography uh, and sociology. Uh, but I have a particular interest in gender inequality in universities and research organisations, and more specifically on how to challenge and address gender inequalities in uh, these types of organisations. So my focus has been, I suppose, on the possibility of change and on the nature and effectiveness of interventions uh, for change. Um, so I think it's widely, widely acknowledged now um, uh, that um, you know, the university is a gendered institution uh, replete with gender power arrangements. And this is what Fiona asked me to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to say a, a little bit about that, uh, about how we might go about doing research on this, mm -hmm. and just some reflections really from a couple of uh, projects that I've been involved in. Uh, and I do think that this is now quite widely acknowledged. Um, you know, the university has actually become a focus for change efforts and interventions, often driven by national and international policies. Uh, so together with other colleagues in this university, I've been involved in two such uh, um, interventions. Uh, one of these was a project called Through the Glass Ceiling, which was an intervention aimed at uh, professional development and mentoring for female academics and researchers. Uh, and the other was called Genovate, which was an EU-funded action research project to develop and implement a gender equality action plan in our own university. Um, now, I suppose I could say we were largely coming from a theoretical perspective that recognised the role of gendered and gendering structures within the university and how all of these uh, intersect and reinforce each other, both formal and informal structures. In other words, uh, I suppose drawing attention to how we do gender in everyday life and how sometimes seemingly small and banal decisions or events or moments actually have a cumulative effect over time. And these processes, as we've been hearing about already this morning, are insidious because they're very often invisible or less visible. And they're hidden in the taken for granted acceptance of how things are done uh, and how things are. Um, and in this way, they operate very powerfully, um, making the underlying issues much harder to identify and to challenge. So what we learn from these two projects, through the glass ceiling and generate about power arrangements in the university? Um, I'm just going to kind of focus on kind of three key areas. The first of these is um, what we, I suppose, uh, realised uh, was that power holding in the sense of the authority to influence how things are done in an institution is slippery. It moves around. It's never vested in one individual or one body or one committee. And this became really evident to us as we sought to find the actors with influence and capacity within the organisation. We found that we were constantly being referred on to someone else who would refer us on to someone else in this kind of never-ending cycle uh, of um, referral uh, with no real change. And we became aware of it because we were not just, I suppose, doing research on this, we were involved in action research. And we were seeking to implement actions for change while also researching the process of implementation. Uh, so we took a reflective approach and we documented our experiences as we were going along and our reflections. And this reflection, I think, helped us to crystallise our thoughts about the very slippery nature of authority. Um, but of course, this slipperiness doesn't mean that gendered power or patriarchal arrangements don't exist. 
uh, but it does point us to the role of the informal, the less visible, tacit cultural processes that interact with the formal and that work to reproduce uneven power arrangements. And I think um, Sarah Ahmed's work provides us with brilliant insights into some of the ways in which this works, and she uses the concept of strategic inefficiency uh, to refer to uh, the way that things appear to not be working in the system. Uh, so, you know, rules are not being implemented, but actually that's how the system works. That's how the system reproduces itself, how it maintains the status quo. So the other uh, kind of second point I want to make is that I suppose we realised as well that targeting formal rules and policies on their own doesn't work. Proposals for rule changes can win approval and endorsement officially, so very similar to what we've just heard about, but the implementation doesn't necessarily follow. Uh, in Genovate, we were very ambitious and we sought to achieve structural transformation, no less. Uh, and as we worked to build the legitimacy of our proposed gender actions for the university, we were made constantly aware, I think, of the power of the informal to undermine the formal. So we could take one proposed action, one example, uh, such as a policy of a minimum of 40% women on the most strategic high-level uh, committees within the organisation. This type of policy might be officially endorsed, uh, but implementation doesn't necessarily follow. Um, and uh, what, what, what I think is going on here is that the messy realities of governance structures involve formal and informal procedures that are themselves highly gendered, that govern how people get onto committees, how people are invited onto committees, um, that, that involve layers of ex officio representations of some committees onto other committees and onto other committees and informal you know, patterns of being invited onto them. And they also involve related structures of status, prestige and privilege that are highly gendered and that help to reinforce then these norms. And therefore implementation in reality is actually very difficult. Uh, so in other words, trying to bring out a change about a change like this can bring us up against the cold face of institutional gender power arrangements that work to undermine, resist and ignore a decision that's made on paper or that's endorsed as a good idea. Uh, and I think in terms of how we do research, then it does raise challenges for doing research that in, can capture this messiness and that can get beyond the official discourses to the less visible processes. And the third thing I suppose that I'd like to say is that what we found actually is that very often change happens in unexpected ways mm -hmm. and that the really powerful changes happen when gender consciousness is raised among all actors from the very top to the very bottom of the organisation and you get a kind of a collective impetus for change being mobilised. And in Through the Glass Evening, actually, we found that the most exciting outcome was the creation of a space for those who are most affected by inequalities, i.e. women, mm -hmm. to connect, to share, to build a sense of a felt need for change uh, in building a kind of a collective uh, identity that was crucial in naming the gender issue and beginning to challenge how things are uh, in kind of developing a resistance to patriarchy. And similarly in Genovate, I think we're probably most proud of our impact on building a momentum for change um, by raising awareness across the institution, raising the question and legitimising the discussion of gender issues within the university. Uh, and again, I think this raises interesting questions for us as researchers about how we can capture institutional change if it actually happens in unexpected ways and in unpredictable spaces. Mm -hmm. And it highlights the importance of paying attention to the spaces of resistance as well as the spaces of the power holders um, as we're doing our research. So I'm going to finish off with just a few uh, comments. First of all, I think in the context, the current climate that we've got of this kind of increasing attention to gender and diversity and the proliferation almost of formally sanctioned policies and plans, then the, for, the informal can become even more informal, less visible, and more insidious. And the importance of focusing even more on the informal in both research and policy, I think, becomes even more important. Secondly, um, I think that efforts to address gender power structures and inequalities can't succeed unless they involve those who are most affected by those power structures, i.e. women and in particular those women who are most disadvantaged by the system. And I think the processes of change have to be participatory and have to open spaces for those who are most affected to shape the agenda, not necessarily to do the work of implementation, which is what happens, but actually to speak and to be listened to. Uh, 
And another point I think uh, that's worth making and that um, came to me in the previous session where we spoke about the importance of male allies and so on. I also think the importance of cross-disciplinary alliances uh, is really important. Uh, and our own universities are spaces of you know, multiple disciplines. And I suppose I'm kind of very conscious as someone who isn't a political scientist of uh, the connections between the work we're doing and the work you know, in the social sciences, political sciences, and so on. But also that very often the spaces of our committees and boards and so on across the university are cross-disciplinary spaces where we can actually support one another, I think, uh, and that we can use you know, um, alliances and make alliances to actually progress the agenda in those spaces. Uh, and finally, I suppose just a comment about research methods. Um, research and institutions does need to be very cognizant of the subtle and less visible ways in which some power relations work, which produce and reproduce institutions. Um, so how, you know, what kinds of research methods can help us to get at these? And certainly I would agree with previous speakers that we need to involve qualitative methods, ethnographic methods, and so on. And I think we also need to ask how can we frame research projects and research problems in a way that allows us to get at this as well? And what research questions do we need to ask in the first place? Let me bring it back to the research questions. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Katrina. Katrina herself has been a very important actor in terms of gender awareness, particularly in this institution. So I would like to pay tribute to you for that. Um, could I invite the five speakers to take to the stage? We'll have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, I, I might just say at the outset, as somebody who's not a specialist in this particular area, I've been really struck by the presentations, the synergies between them. Mm -hmm. But I think what stood out for me most especially was the power of the informal. Mm -hmm. All of you, to a certain extent, stress that. And that's, um, it's a very valuable finding, but it's also very challenging in and of itself. Um, so we'll open it to the floor for questions. Hi, I'm Honor Tui, and I am uh, currently doing a, an LLM called the School of Law, uh, International Human Rights Law, actually. Uh, so the one thing I wanted to say first is that I've come across these feminist judgments. Um, there's books yeah, based in Ireland and UK and Canada and America, maybe Australia. Uh, also, my heart is beating really fast. Anyway, this one's because I'm, I'm looking forward to, doing, uh, to learning that methodology on how they're applying uh, feminist judgments to older cases mm. to see how they might have come out. But I, I'm spotting um, a link between the formal and informal, and uh, public and private, and then in, in, inter in international law between binding and non-binding law. Mm. And um, I've been through two uh, peer review processes in the last year uh, to get it published. And, um, uh, one of the big issues that I'm fighting with ed editors on is leaving the ambiguity between binding and non-binding law in my writing. Mm -hmm. So they want me to always say, tell us what's binding and tell us what's not. Make it really clear to the reader. But my point would be, actually, that's where the power of international law lies, where mm -hmm. it's kind of mixed up and it moves from one to the other and that's how, how, how it all develops. So um, I suppose uh, my question is maybe it's advice I need, but it's just to to, to put that out there and then to say, like, how do I continue to fight? Because sometimes I'm, I'm liable to go, you know what, just get the thing published and I can fight that when I'm a professor. <laughs> um, I might just try and take one or two other questions because we, we don't have much time. Anybody else? Blanca. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone. It was great listening to you. And I'm one of the people trying to um, look at the informal. So my project is... Um, uh, exploring the institutional response of the TS1 and the process of the TS1. Um, so I'm really trying to get at the formal, informal, formal interface. And my question is about institutional ethnography. If you have, any, if anyone has any thoughts on it, and have you ever had experience in using that framework in trying to get at the informal, which is really key in my research. Mm. Okay. Anyone else? No. Nope. We'll take those two too. Who who'd like to? I'll do you want to take this? I'll start because I've done some work on international law and written a book on the ICC. Um, and I think one of the issues for you maybe is you've got to find the right journal. Mm -hmm. Really got to find the right journal. And we all know that about our work. But um, having engaged, I work on the border of law and political science. And um, 
both of them have their uh, constraints, <laughs> let's say. Um, and Yvonne was pointing to that too, you know, finding friendly places to publish can be, that can be the, the challenge. And it's not that your work isn't important and good, but they're sending them to the wrong readers who are not getting the important point you're making. Because I think you're exactly right that the there is this sort of, there's so much blurriness in international law, even, you know, hard international law is very soft compared to domestic law. So um, I think you're right to be talking about it, you know, in the sense of a spectrum or a continuum or something like that. But maybe it's, um, it's, it's more a socio-legal uh, issue maybe and a, and a feminist one at that. So looking out for favourable journals um, will be the, the key. I would say an international feminist legal journal would be very friendly to your work. Um, and then, I mean, it, there is that problem of then we, we just keep talking to a narrow audience, mm -hmm. but better to start somewhere than not get your important work um, published, would be my advice. But let's have a chat after this. <laughs> yeah. And second question, Natalie or Louise Gann? Mm. I guess, the, sorry, so the question was um, doing institutional ethnography. Yeah. And in terms and of using it to, to get at the informal, or I, I guess I'd just like to know more maybe about the methods that you're using or have used or know of being used to get at the informal. Yeah, I, th I think for us, um, because we used a variety of methods, so um, looking at the formal documentation first and then um, interviews, but also being cognizant that there's different types of interviewing, and um, you know, I think I mentioned that walking interviews. Yeah. You know, often yeah, really great. useful because um, you're not looking at each other and um, people reveal a lot. And people more. reveal a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, spending time with the person, observing what they're doing, and then maybe interviewing. As Louise said, you know, you you the richness in those interviews were really evident. Um, looking at um, the documented landscape, so really taking um, observing. Um, in one of our companies, they, were, they had this incredible campaign that was happening on their screensavers, on their wrists, everywhere. Like, but it was completely contradictory to what the rule. Like, they were, you know, all about well-being and and you know, yet and they even had a beautiful brochure. Yet, what was you know devastating was the man who told me about his panic attacks as he travelled into work every day was the pinup boy on that world, and no one knew. So, you know, just looking for those sorts of gaps between what's being said, mm -hmm. form, like, you know, and the, the, the different narratives that are occurring um, and how they're playing out because they often will show, um, you know, what are the rules in use and how hard it is sometimes, you know, back to Fiona's work, that sort of challenge of the nested newness when things mm -hmm. are introduced and there is this, you know, historical legacy there that... It's, it's battling. Um, videos, um, you know, there, there's just a variety and I think that's where ethnography allows you to really um, step into a world and also obviously the, the reflections or the reflexivity of the researcher themselves, I mean, that often um, draws out some really important um, findings in terms of how, you know, um, your position in the research and um, the different power dynamics within the research as well. So, yeah, and I, I would journey say, as well. I, I would say that uh, in terms of the reflexivity, it's really super important. And Nat talked about the twinning and then the debriefing. So we always mm. had a debrief. And even if we weren't on site, say a couple of times, Nat was sort of up in a regional area and she, she'd still ring through and we and she would just tell me what happened and we would record it on our phone and then we got it transcribed. And then we code that. And then we yeah. code it because we still saw that as um, data yeah. for us. Oh, and yeah. actually it was really interesting because when we started we weren't sure what we were going to find and then we kept seeing these recurring patterns and now to say again I've had that conversation and again. And so then we had the data and recording of it. So find a sounding board or journal it yourself. And then that in that thesis, there's these beautiful vignettes of her reflecting on what she was seeing. Like mm -hmm. uh, one I really distinctly remember is 
where people sat in a room yeah. and um, who got the window seats and who didn't. Or even who got a seat at the table. Who got a seat at the table, yeah. you know. Um, but the other thing is too, from you as a research perspective, if you're, I'm assuming you work within the university. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I came as an insider, so I remember my first conversation with Louise. I mean, I was dressed like those women when we went to that hyper of feminine and I thought went, oh. Um, so, you know, have that um, interaction with, you know, having a, an, other researchers to bounce things off and, and to also, if you can do it with others, it's, it's very rich yeah. because you're coming at it also from different places whilst drawing on the structure of the conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even if you don't have another, like you're paired up with the researchers, mm -hmm. find someone who will be your sounding board yeah. at least to, to ask you questions back about it so you've got it over time, I would say. Mm -hmm. Just to know, just something, uh, two observations. Uh, my name is Deirdre, I'm in the philosophy department, doing a PhD in philosophy here, here at UCC. But there were two things that I observed when everybody was talking. Is, uh, one young woman starting out and the point she made in relation to um, does she just shut up and do her work and uh, get her professorship and then she can be whatever she wants to be and say and have some influence which is something I think that everybody grapples with um, but then their ethics kind of say to them no I want to do this right as well um, and then the other thing um, that I thought about was when you were showing the slide in relation to the men on the construction with their panic attacks and with their family worries and all that, the similarities between men and women mm -hmm. because we too are going into work with our panic attacks mm -hmm. and our stresses and our strength. Mm -hmm. So if there's some way that we can marry and let men know that we're all in this together, and that our, dis our discussions around um, our needs are going to support mm -hmm. their discussions as well. Mm -hmm. If that, uh, may maybe that's happening, but that's just two observations mm -hmm. as well as today. I guess that's the bigger endeavor, really, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Um, I, I think what's ha really interesting about our research, Nat's now given 30 discussions, uh, talk, talk, 30 talks to industry, one International Women's Day, what, nine, no, nine around that day. Mm -hmm. and, and most of the room now are men. Mm -hmm. A lot of the room is men because we're talking about men in our research, so they're paying yes. attention to what mm -hmm. we're saying, which is really interesting. So you've got to hold those things but it's in intention. You don't want it, you don't want it yeah. to become research about men yes. only. It is about the, it's about gender dynamics. It is. Mm -hmm. And that's what you've got to keep reinforcing, and but bringing them along and getting them to listen, because that I mean, they were, when we first started reporting back to our companies, they were shocked, absolutely shocked. They, mm -hmm. When they've got the figures in front of them about what's happening, and also linking it to gender, the fact that there is gendered effects for both men and women, the rules have gendered effects, mm -hmm. or that you know your gendered actors as well, the fact that, you know, you feel like you have to wait until you get to professors and the other, you know. But um, I, I think it's also, you know, highlighting masculinities and how, you know, to Louise's point, I think she made before, that there is great advantage and powerfulness in the performance of, um, say, hegemonic masculinity, but there is also a, a side effect for a lot of men who aren't enjoying that position at the top, which is, um, you know, in our case in construction, which was the stress and the double the national suicide rate and those types of components. Um, yeah, so sort of pilot bringing gender support. Men have gender too. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I think on that note, um, <laughs> we'll finish up. Uh, 